and welcome to our in-depth look at the end of the road for Holden. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. It was once the most dominant force in the Australian automotive industry. Holden built iconic and much-loved cars, including the FJ, the HQ, the Monaro and, of course, the Commodore. In 1948, the company finally achieved its long-held dream of manufacturing the first ever all-Australian motor car. On the 29th of November, the Prime Minister Ben Shifley unveiled the 48215, which later became affectionately known as the FX. In its heyday, Holden employed tens of thousands of Australian workers at plants across the country. At Elizabeth in South Australia, they had three shifts working around the clock. The plant was so big it had streets named after famous car models, including Tirana and Commodore. It even had its own bank. For more than 50 years, Holden's were Australia's favourite car. In the 1950s, half of all new cars sold here were Holden's. It remained the top-selling car manufacturer until 2002. Taking everything in sight The future now is in our hands It's running perfectly to plan The wild map draws in 84 It's only just a glimpse of what's in store Australia's rising well, fast forward to the 20th of October 2017, the last ever locally made Commodore rolled off the production line in suburban Adelaide, signalling the end of car manufacturing in Australia. It's staggering to think that just 18 years after being the number one brand in Australia, the Roaring Lion will soon disappear. So what happened to the car company that had been Dinky Die Australian? Australia, what's your favourite sport? Football. Snack. Ice. Animal. Kangaroo. And what's your favourite car, Australia? Holden. Let me see, that's football, meat pies, kangaroos and Holden cars, huh? Right. Well, you sure sound like Australia to me. We are. Well, then you better tell me again, because I just might forget. We love football, meat pies, kangaroos and Holden cars. Football, meat pies, kangaroos and Holden cars. So did the company fail to adapt to a changing market? Propped up by government subsidies, Holden cut thousands of jobs but remained economically unviable before its parent company General Motors announced Holden's demise. I am angry, like I think of many of Australians would be. Australian taxpayers put billions into this, into this multinational company, and they let the brand just wither away on their watch, and now they're leaving it behind. So what will happen to the legendary motor racing rivalry Holden versus Ford? And will Holden owners now be left with cars that can't be serviced or repaired? First, let's look back at how Holden reached the end of the road. No other car performs like it because Holden is the only car designed and built for Australia. Holden built its reputation on making cars in Australia for Australians and Australian conditions. The new Australian automobile, designed and tested by General Motors Engineering Department. The brand was a symbol of the nation's identity, earning a legion of loyal fans. More than 130 Australian-made cars coming off the production line every day. But all the nostalgia in the world couldn't save Holden from its gamble to continue producing large sedans after the global financial crisis when the market was demanding smaller cars or SUVs. We have just informed our employees and our dealer partners um, and I can confirm to you that GM has taken the very difficult decision to wind down Holden operations in Australia and New Zealand uh, by 2021. It was the end of the line for Holden, a company that started in 1856 when James Alexander Holden was making saddles in Adelaide. The firm evolved over the years to making vehicle upholstery and eventually car bodies. In 1928, the famous Holden logo was created with the lion and stone. Three years later, the American giant General Motors merged with Holden to become GMH. 
During the war years, Holden's car production was diverted to weapons, aircraft and engines. It's the first really big public uh, preview of this car, about which Australia has heard so much, and there's an air of excitement. In 1949, the first Holden went on sale for $733, a staggering 94 weeks wages for the average worker. But even then, Holden couldn't keep up with demand. The 50s, 60s and 70s were boom times for Holden. In 1953, the iconic FJ Holden was introduced. Holden, you and my Holden. By 1962, Holden had sold one million cars and was exporting them to Asia, Africa and the Middle East. Ten years later, the company unveiled the HQ Kingswood. It would go on to become the highest selling Holden of all time. More than 480,000 of them were built in just four years. And it entered Australian folklore. The Kingswood? <laughs> You're not taking the Kingswood! <laughs> but as storm clouds gathered for the automotive industry, the oil crisis was looming. Making motor cars is our biggest secondary industry. When it sneezes, the economy catches a cold. At present, it has the sniffles. I think the worst is, is behind us once we get through March, and I think that from that point of view, we can look forward that there will be definitely an upswing uh, starting, say, uh, April, May. Commodore, a new Holden so advanced it will challenge all your ideas about Australian cars. As the turbulent decade drew to a close, Holden introduced the most popular car to date, the Commodore. It would go on to produce more than two million of them. This is it. This time I know it's for real. This is it. What drove Holden's success in the golden years was just how well they did on the racetrack. The high-performance thoroughbreds were just the souped-up versions of the suburban workhorses. So you could do the shopping or the school run in the very same make and model that was tearing up the racetracks. It won races and captured hearts. They were as popular on the track as they were off it. And Mark Scaife will go back to back. At Bathurst, he secures another Australian touring car title. In the 80s, Holden's fortunes began to change as the entire automotive industry struggled. The Falcon eclipsed the Commodore for the first time, and for the next six years, it was the country's best-selling Australian car. Is the moment, savour it, John. It was a great contest. But by the end of the decade, the Commodore had reclaimed its number one spot. With an all-new, stronger body, giving you handling and control like never before. In 1996, the Commodore started its 15-year reign as the nation's favourite car. Ten years later, Holden launched its billion-dollar baby, the VE Commodore, a car completely designed and engineered in Australia from the ground up. For a period of time, for a lot of Australian families, there was a very simple choice to make. You were either in a Holden camp or with Ford. It wasn't just a love affair, it defined you. The car itself said something about who you were. It was here on the racetracks that Ford and Holden fought for supremacy, a rivalry that's now been consigned to history. With Holden's demise, one half of that magical equation now disappears. Oh, Steve, could you move the Chimera? I need to get the Tirana out so I can get to the Commodore. I'll have to get the keys of Cortina, but I'm going to move that Chimera. But development came at a cost. The federal government injected more than $2 billion into the company as it scrambled to keep Australian car workers in jobs. It was all too little, too late. This is an investment, not a subsidy. 
and investment in capacity, skills, innovation. Two years later, Holden announced it was pulling out of Australia, sacking nearly 3,000 workers. Today we're announcing that Holden will cease manufacturing in Australia by the end of 2017. In 2016, the last cruise rolled off the production line. One month later, the Port Melbourne engine plant closed after 68 years of continuous service and producing more than 10 million engines. A year later, on the 20th of October, the end of shift siren at the Elizabeth plant sounded. Today is a big day. The last Australian-made Commodore rolled off the line at about 10.45. It was the death knell for the Australian car manufacturing industry. Yeah, it's just shattering, absolutely shattering. It's just really sad that it has to all end. Holden continued to sell imported cars. The company built its reputation by wrapping itself in the Australian flag. But in the end, importing cars and slapping on the Holden badge betrayed the company's roots. It's a Holden. It's a great way to move the strength and the power of Holden. Its demise was reflected in sales figures. Last year, Holden sold just 43,176 new vehicles, the lowest since 1953. The Holden badge, along with its racing pedigree, may soon be gone, but what does that mean for their legion of fans? And more importantly, those who actually own a Holden. Will the latest Holden cars become financial liabilities or collector's trophies? <laughs> The reality is Holden has been driven to extinction. Well, with us now to discuss all this is the Holden racing legend and Fox Sports commentator Mark Scaife. The economist Nikki Hutley from Deloitte Access Economics. In Melbourne, we're joined by Dan Gardner, a motoring journalist with Which Car? And from Adelaide, Tony Dassett, who's a Holden fan. Tony, I'd like to begin with you. This announcement from Holden would have been unthinkable a generation ago. How did you take the news? Well, I didn't have tears in my eyes, but very dis disappointed. I thought we'd at least get another three years or more out of it. And uh, it's eventually was going to happen anyway. Uh, Mark, what about you? You dedicated so much of your life to motor racing, to the Holden brand. Uh, did the announcement catch you by surprise? Uh, totally. I mean, I, I think um, Australians were gobsmacked by the announcement. It was one of those things that I never thought there'd be a time uh, within the culture of our country that a Holden brand wouldn't be strong and survive through uh, the ups and downs of the marketplace. But uh, no, I was, I was really knocked around by it. I mean, I, I actually made the comment it was like a death of a family member and I felt for so many of those employees and dealers, etc., that have been so uh, heavily affected by it. In observing all this, what are the main factors at play here? Look, enormous factors at play, but essentially this is globalisation at work. You know, this is not the first company to disappear either from Australia or from the world. We see this constantly with technological disruption, with globalisation of supply chains, as I've said. You know, if you have to be subsidised to stay in business, if you can't make a case for what Australia is, Australia is a relatively small marketplace, then the economics just don't stack up. And, you know, as much as some people might love a particular brand, you know, we've had those ads by Australian. In, at the end of the day, people make a decision that makes economic sense to them. And clearly, buying Holdens was not, was not what families or small businesses chose to do. So, Dan, on that basis, was this problem much bigger than what Holden was facing just domestically? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's very easy to focus just on the, the Australian case, but what this signifies is a far bigger problem for General Motors globally. Um, Australia was probably a very easy decision, although on a personal level, of course, it was difficult um, to cull a relatively small brand from an exclusively right-hand drive market would have been one of the easier steps for General Motors to take to try and stop it hemorrhaging cash all around the world, not just in Australia. Uh, Dan, what about the situation around tariffs, around subsidies, the point at which they were given over to the car companies, including Holden, some $2 billion there. Were they enough? Was it too late? Was it not, uh, just simply geared the wrong way? 
It's important to make the point that there's not a single car industry in the world that isn't subsidised and supported by the government. So I think when uh, virtually all support for Holden was pulled out of Australia by the Abbott government, I think that was really the writing on the wall. We knew that manufacturing would end then, and a lot of people said that soon after it, um, the customer loyalty would dry up when they knew it wasn't really a true Australian product anymore, and that was the end. Uh, Mark, was there a failure to adapt to changing markets? I mean, when we think back to, you know, the oil crisis, the Gulf War, the GFC, uh, there were factors there that were making it very difficult for Holden, but it still kept producing these powerful muscle cars. Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, inevitably we can all be geniuses in hindsight. I, I think probably uh, the shift from family cars to SUVs was more significant than what uh, GM was able to forecast and, and yes, they probably missed the, the play a little there. Um, I think overall it actually becomes about product. I think in the end, um, Australians are savvy, you know, they're authentic about what style of car they want. Um, the fragmentation of the market is massive. There's so many brands available in this part of the world for such a small volume. So there's, there's lots of parts of this puzzle that you could argue that Holden didn't have a product lineup which was, which was good enough. Uh, Tony, I want to ask you, at what point does that love, that die-hard dedication to Holden meet that sort of pragmatism that Mark is talking about? Well, I think it's the younger generation at the present moment are looking for a smaller car, a fast little four-cylinder or turbocharged car. And I think it's where the market for the younger person is going in the sports car side of it. And the family people are now looking at the the four-wheel drives and all that sort of vehicle now. And the marketplace from overseas, they are so much cheaper. Tariffs aren't helping us out at all. And Nikki, I want to bring you in this, on this question of whether Holden read the tea leaves correctly. How much blame can it take for, for not adapting? And, and how much was it just out of its control? Look, I think there's elements of both there, Jeremy. I think, you know, un unfortunately for Holden, they, they clearly didn't read the market. If you have a look at what the top 10 selling cars in Australia are, you know, Holden gets one right at the end and it's not type of those those smaller cars that first time buyers are going for um, the little Mazda 2s or whatever that are cheap and that are easy to get into the market on you know tariffs are obviously um, you know an issue and there's a good question around whether the luxury car tax you know should have been implemented there's clearly a, a question and economists have said that a, that a five percent tariff was actually quite reasonable um, that there were benefits to having that um, the reasons for that to be there to have that level of protection because of the flow through benefits of the economy by IP and down the supply chain of the car industry. So that by subsidising the car industry a little bit, we did get some benefits for the broader economy, but we certainly couldn't afford to keep subsidising it to the tune that we were because Australian families were actually missing out. And I think it's really interesting, you know, I'm in that sort of betwixt generation because I, I grew up quite a bit in, in the UK and, and then came back to Australia. So I missed out on that, you know, Holden is everything to you. And I think, you know, that I now look at my kids in their 20s and they don't have that same feeling. And we see them making those decisions. They don't have that same relationship. And you've got to be careful. Look at Nokia, you know, just look at Kodak. Look at all the brands that if they don't keep pace with the economic reality, you know, cultural love is not enough. At the end of the day, people have to make sensible economic decisions for themselves, for the country. Support for the car industry is not just about the car industry, because as Nikki says, it, it flows right through the economy, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And to take that point further, um, people have been, since the announcement that Commodore uh, uh, Holden was going to go, people have been using this expression, which is sort of fickle consumerism. And to me, that's a tautology. Consumerism is in in inherently fickle. So I think to expect people to just keep on buying blindly by buying Holdens because they were local when clearly they weren't anymore was probably slightly ignorant. So, yeah, there's a lot more going on there. Uh, Tony, I want your insights into how that marketing worked for you as a Holden fan through the generations. Well, I've owned them since I was 16 and a half years old, and it's my first car I bought was an FJ Holden. So they've been on my life all my life, and I still deal with them every single day, restoring and rebuilding them. But the thing is that it's harder to try and compete with an overseas market, and it's very hard for Australia to be able to build a vehicle at the price. Even if they built them overseas and assembled them here, the competition isn't there and people aren't buying it. Uh, Mark, you were a player in that very tribal Holden versus Ford rivalry. What was it like on the inside? Well, 
at its peak, and if you think about Commodore as the number one nameplate in Australia for 15 years, we almost sold 100,000 of them in the early 2000s uh, a year. So uh, it was uh, an incredible success story in terms of a brand. And it came from the energy crisis when a Kingswood was too big, a Commodore come into vogue, and from the late 70s, a Commodore was, uh, was obviously a big part of Holden's product lineup. Um, and it was a, a case in the older days where it was win on Sunday, sell on Monday. So the reality around Holden and HSV and HRT as the Holden factory team was that it, it linked up perfectly. Australians loved it. Um, you know, the tribal rivalry was a big, a big part of that. But Holden in the day was a, a large part of the, the cultural landscape of this country. It was a big part of our DNA. And, and one of the things I think that we have to really respect, and, uh, and I, I take everybody's point about maybe missing the market and not having the right product, but if you think about the last Com Commodore that was built in this country, it was the best rear wheel drive car in the world from a value for money perspective. Absolutely superb car. So it wasn't just about that car at the time and what, what we actually manufactured, it was a changing marketplace which was missed. It, it is absolutely fascinating, that whole idea of win on Sunday, buy on Monday. Did you as a racing driver get a sense of where that started diverging, where that pragmatism started to come in and maybe people were sort of having second thoughts on the Monday? Yeah, look, I think much later in Commodore's life there was a bit of that going and I, I think um, the tribalism started to wane a little and, that, and that's not necessarily for any real reason other than People are savvy, you know, we're, we're authentic. Australians understand what's going on, and, and especially around cars. And the, the ability for Australians to buy a locally made Commodore was a big part of the story, it was a big part of the cultural landscape and how ingrained the brand was. So I think those two things tend to deviate when you don't have uh, the authenticity based around the product, the market relevance. Uh, Dan, was that authenticity diluted when Holden started having these sharing cooperative agreements with companies such as Nissan, with Toyota and then Opel later on? Certainly, yeah. I mean, you can't keep that kind of detail from the consumer. And as soon as people realise that you're not getting such a specifically Australian product anymore, then they started to lose interest quite quickly. Um, to take what Mike was saying before, I, I have to reiterate that point. The VE and the VF, the last of the Commodores, were the finest vehicles that Col Holden had ever made. And it, that's what makes this announcement all the more sad, is that we were really showing the world at that stage just how good we could do things in Australia. But as so many of your guests this evening have been saying, that's not enough. Just producing a really good car, sadly, is not everything. Tony, I wonder what you make of that sentiment uh, and, and what you make of that, that sharing agreement to, that uh, Holden had with Nissan, with Toyota, with Opel. Did it dilute your sense of the Australianness of the Holden? I can undergo by the view I see and the people I deal with and all the friends in the market that I do. And I, I agree with that situation. It's not, it wasn't a homemade product. It was a product that was, um, part of it was built overseas and it just wasn't that genuine Holden car. What does the car racing look like in the future? The DNA of what supercar racing or Australian touring car racing, we're celebrating 60 years this year, and whether it's the names, the Moffats and the Brocks, or it's the Ford versus Holden, we've had times through the course of our history where Volvo's won the Australian Touring Car Championship. You know, BMW have, have been dominant. Alan Moffat drove Mazdas. Um, Peter Brock drove for Volvo and for Ford. So there's been times when things change around. And I, and I think it's, it's incumbent on us as the premier sport of the industry in this part of the world to come up with a product plan which keeps people engaged. And, you know, the noise and the, and the robustness and the, the toughness and the things that are innate to what our touring car racing looks like um, will we'll remain with us for a long time, I'm sure. Uh, Tony, you own more cars than I think anyone I've ever met. Uh, some 50 plus cars, is that right? Yes, but they're not all on the road, mate. They are, <laughs> they're ones we use to build ones to put them back on the road. Do, do you wonder what happens now to those cars, those Holdens, uh, and what people do? If you, if you own a Holden, what are you going to do when the car becomes uh, you know, kind of falls further back into history in terms of servicing and replacing parts. With the early Holdens, they're very basic and I think there were still a lot of spares around. And the thing with history is everyone likes to own a little bit of history. 
And I tell you what, it is, it's really helping a business like mine because people are suddenly looking back and saying, oh, my God, Holdens are gone. I've got to get something. And uh, they do, even if it's something to hang on the wall in their bar room. Now, just a final reflection from each of you, Tony. Uh, are there particular standout memories from your lifetime about your relationship with a Holden? We haven't got enough time to discuss them all, <laughs> but I can tell you now, my, hold, my birthday is on the 29th of November. This year, Holdens will be 72 years old, and I'll be 70, and I'll still be building these old girls. Uh, Dan, what about you? I wasn't fortunate enough to have an upbringing as a child in Australia. Um, but if I had been, then the HQ era it was the golden era for Holden. Um, I wish I'd been around for a little bit of that. Uh, I can talk about that historically, but for me, as a relatively new Australian, as I already said, the VE and the VF was when I came to Australia, and, and I didn't have the, the uh, emotional attachment to the brand when I arrived in Australia, for obvious reasons. Through those cars, the last of the Commodores, I really learned to love Holden and that made me feel a little bit more at home here and a little bit more Australian. And so when we got to the end of the line and they stopped building cars in this country, um, that was really uh, a, a culmination of sadness and happiness and, and sort of pride all in one. And that, that really for me was the golden era personally. Uh, Nikki, what about you? Well, I have to confess I have never actually owned a Holden. Um, I look at cars as things that you buy the cheapest that you can. They lose half their value when you get out. They get you from A to B and you try and use them as little as possible. <laughs> Spoken like a true economist. <laughs> Mark Scaife, I know you'll have a heap of memories. Is there one standout moment for you as a former Holden racing driver and a, a, a key a cultural touchstone for the whole nation? Yeah, look, I, I think there's a couple of things. The first one for me is that I think there's in every family in this country, they've got some sort of Holden story. You know, there's their first car or their their mum, you know, had a Tirana or the sister was their first car was a Gemini or whatever it is. And I, and I think that part of Australian culture and the landscape that we've lived in for so long now is is it, it embodies so much of that DNA and so much of the brand strength that was once upon a time incredible. And and for me. Um, to win the Australian Touring Car Championship or the Supercast Championship and to win Bathurst uh, in the same year in 2002 when Commodore was the number one nameplate was uh, pretty powerful for us. It was, uh, it was, it was something that I'll, I'll always remember. Well, I tell you what, I learnt to parallel park at a Commodore, which is why I'm still amazing at it today. That's <laughs> what I owe Holden. It's good to talk to all of you. Mark Scaife, Dan Gardner, Tony Dowsett, Nikki Hutley, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And we leave you with a look back at some classic Holden memories over the decades. Australia, what's your favourite sport? Football. Snack. Ice. Animal. Kangaroo. And what's your favourite car, Australia? Holden. Let me see, that's football, meat pies, kangaroos and Holden cars, huh? Right. Well, you sure sound like Australia to me. We are. Well, then you better tell me again, because I just might forget. We love football, meat pies, kangaroos and Holden cars. Football, meat pies, kangaroos and Holden cars. That's football, meat pies, kangaroos and Holden cars.